Here we go. So edible flowers themselves, they've been enjoyed for over 5,000 years. It's a long time. So they were first recorded in use in China uh, about 3,000 years uh, B uh, BCE, before the Common Era. Uh, they're also, also recorded um, as used by the Romans, who loved to use roses and lavender and violets in food. And of course, they're used today, um, as we'll see in the next few slides. So this image uh, shows a borage flower, a beautiful blue borage flower, um, which is one of the ones I think that Joan's going to be talking about today. So which flowers are edible? Well, there's quite a long list of them, which is great for us because we can, we can try and grow many of them. So here are sort of 10 of the most common um, variety. So we've got cornflowers, dahlias, hibiscus, honeysuckle, magnolia. Well, they'll be the first ones to come out. I think magnolias are going to be out in another uh, few weeks time. Uh, nasturtiums, which are pictured here. Uh, there's also pansies and roses, scented geraniums, cape and cape jasmine. And uh, you can read more about these flowers at the fantastic uh, Thompson and Morgan web pages, uh, which have got lots of really interesting information about edible flowers. So more and un more unusual varieties are forget-me-nots, sunflowers, hollyhock, lilac, Camellias, fuchsias, gladioli, and peony, and alpine pinks. So a huge variety of different um, flowers which can grow in many different conditions and uh, should be very tasty. So here are some that you should never eat. They're extremely toxic, so please don't try any of those. Um, there's daffodils, poppies, foxgloves, oleander, Clematis, bluebells and rhododendrons, larkspur, hydrangeas, and lily of the valley. So definitely ones to avoid. So um, steer, clear, steer clear of these. So there's a flower coming up in the next couple of slides I'd like you to have a guess at and put your answer in the chat if you can, and we'll come back to it. So here's the, here's the flower I want, I'd like you to try and guess what this is. So, how do you go about choosing which flowers to pick? So best to pick them when they're fresh from the garden and they taste better if you can pick them in the morning. Uh, you can store them in the fridge uh, and try to use them within a few days. Okay. Here's this flower again. So if you're in any doubt as to whether the flower is edible, don't eat it. If you have pollen allergies, it's probably best to avoid eating flowers. And don't pick faded or dusty or old discoloured flowers, or flowers that grow near where there's lots of traffic, or an area that animals use. Try and avoid those areas. And don't treat your edible flowers with pesticides. Um, you know, if you have problems with pests, cut your, cut your plants back and try and get fresh regrowth, but don't treat them with um, pesticides. They're not good for us to eat either. Okay, so did you manage to name the flower? Don't know if you did. Who no marks if you said it was a courgette? And ooh, courgettes can be dipped in batter and fried. Courgette flowers seemingly. So it's one to one to look up if you fancy trying that recipe out. Okay, so how do you prepare your flowers? Well, you can wash and dry your flowers gently by dipping them in water and shaking them. Uh, the petals are often the best parts of the flowers to eat. And if you remove the heel at the base of the flower before you eat it, because it's a bit bitter. And larger flowers like this hibiscus here, a big flower, what you'd want to do is remove the stamen and the pistil, which is this big bit at the, the front of the flower here, remove that um, before you uh, eat it, you wouldn't eat that part. Some flowers though, like pansies, um, you can eat them whole. They all, it all taste sweet, so that's nice to remember. So flower uses, what can you use them for? What can you use them for? Well, lots of big 
showstopper cakes if you're into baking. And um, this is a lovely looking cake with lots of edible flowers pressed into the icing. And uh, you can go online and find lots of inspiration for these kind of cakes. This one's by A Beautiful Mess, which I think is a lovely, <laughs> a lovely title. Or you can try decorating cupcakes, like these lovely ones. And you can actually preserve the flowers in sugar if you like. This is a great um, thing to do. It's very easy, a good um, extension activity from picking your flowers. Um, this particular recipe is from Delia Online and it's very easy. It just needs egg whites and a teaspoonful of water and some caster sugar. And you just beat the egg white with some water and you just use a small brush to coat the surface of the petals and then sprinkle them with sugar and then you leave them to dry and when they've completely dried out you can store them away in an airtight container. So that's another idea, something you can do with your once you've picked the flowers to keep them a little longer. You can also put flowers in savoury dishes. So this one is uh, Provencal stuffed apricots and goat cheese salad with edible flowers. You can see the lovely goat's cheese in the centre here. And I think these are the stuffed apric apricots with lovely flowers. There's the borage you can see and pansies and lots of nice leaves. And I think that might be an nasturtium in the back there, that orange one. But uh, delicious. Looking forward to that in the summer. Or you can try making them into ice cubes, which I think look terrific. Uh, you could try making ice lollies as well. Another idea. So lots of ways that you can use your edible flowers. Uh, not forgetting cocktails and mocktails. Come the height of the summer, we'll be looking for something to sit and sip and admire our garden. Um, so I think this is a lovely one. This is uh, mixed berry lemonade sparkler. I'm up for that. <laughs> No. I'll join you, Jenny. <laughs> anyway, enjoy the gardening flower fun in the spring and summer. And I'm going to uh, stop the share and then hand over to Joan now, who's going to give us a lovely demonstration of how to grow all these lovely things. Hey, Joan, how's it going? Okay, I'm good, thank you. Can you hear me all right from here? Yes, thank you. Okay, fabulous. Right, hello everybody. Thanks for joining um, and again in our live Zoom demos. I was really sorry to hear Jenny that it's raining with you because <laughs> it's a cozy day down here in Ayrshire. So you want to pack your bags and come and um, camp out in the garden, something like that. The clocks have changed and we are now officially basking in, well, Ayrshire summertime. How about that? <laughs> And, you know, as the days, I can see the days stretching and I'm starting to feel even more enthusiastic and hopeful for a wee bit of gardening success this year. Now, edible flowers, I've been growing edible flowers for quite a few years. And on the whole, they're relatively easy to, to manage and they've always done well for me. And they're always a great conversation piece for when I produce my fancy flowery ice cubes. So um, that's probably the main reason why I grow the, the borage more than anything else. <laughs> Although edible flowers do make for good conversation, oh, yeah. speak, they should be able to tell you what that is, what the plant is. This one down here, this is um, an nasturtium plant that I sowed, um, oh, six weeks ago now. Um, yeah, about six weeks ago. I'm coming on to discussions in just a short, um, just a little minute or two. So, um, talking about conversation making, um, although all gardening activity, if done in a group setting, is good for conversation, it also lends itself to creating opportunities for social inclusion and also supports other outcomes such as light physical activity and exercise, stress reduction, fine motor skill development, coordination, cognitive skills, loads of things, and accomplishment. So let's get accomplishing. Jenny's PowerPoint, and I like the cake, by the way. I quite like that get messy cake. That looks very inspiring. 
Um, Jenny showed us lots of edible flowers that you can experiment over the coming months. But here today, I'm going to be demoing um, nasturtiums, calendula, which are also known as Scotch marigolds, borage, and the courgette. And I was pleased to see so many people got the courgette um, question that Jenny asked correct. Courgette flowers are so amazing to, to watch develop and unfurl. So I've got my seeds and these are the seeds that I'm going to grow into my edible flower patch. The other things that I need as, um, are some compost. Now this is a seedling compost. Um, most garden centres and DIY stores will stock this, but try and pick a compost that does say it's for seedling or young plants because it will get your seedlings off to a better start. So I've got a compost. You might spot I've got some little white bits through it. That is perlite. Now you don't need to add perlite to your compost. I always do. You can buy it out of garden centres. It just adds, it aids um, insulation, drainage, and it helps with germination. But as I say, don't worry about it if you can't get your hands on it. I've got a selection of trays that I'm going to be sowing my seeds into. Got some big pots, some little pots. Um, I've got a grape dish. Anything that you've got that you might put out to the recycling bin that can get drainage holes either pierced into it or naturally have them in it, like so, um, mushroom boxes and grape boxes, they're suitable for growing seeds into also. And then a couple of other kind of plastic food trays that don't have drainage holes in the bottom. But this tray that does have the drainage holes can sit on top of and it won't leak out onto your windowsill. And I've got some plastic bags and elastic band as well, but I'll get to them in a wee while. Um, what else do we need? Okay, we need to, um, I'm dreadful for always using my hands, um, which is okay, wear gloves. Um, I don't do as I say, not as I do. A beaker and a spoon are a good adaptive tool to have in your, your toolbox. It makes it easier for some folks to work with. Um, I've got my labels and pens, because once the plants, once the seeds are sown, it's hard to remember what is where. And last but not least, my trusty little juice bottle that's got the little bottle top water on it, which makes it a lot easier to water the small seedlings. And it's also good for people that have got um, poorer risk control, sorry, poorer risk strength and helps with coordination. Okay, so the session that I grew a little while ago, and I don't know if any of you joined in our seminar series. We did a project in a Pope live Zoom session. And one of the things we did was um, talked about growing an astrushum wigwam. So some of you might re recognize this plant. This is the one that I potted up that night. And you can see it's already putting on good growth. And this is us only in March. Granted, this is living in my polytunnel, so it's not outdoors, but it's not getting any heat or anything like that. And always remember the little pokey bit to the drop, because I'll tell you, I've had a stick in my eye before, and it is very, very good. Okay, let's get that out of the way. So the first thing I'm going to start with is our nasturtium seeds. Nasturtiums, as Jenny said in the um, PowerPoint presentation, are really tasty. They're probably one of the, the most well-known edible flowers. But not only are the flowers edible, the leaves are too. Um, and this is the one downside of doing things on Zoom and not in person, because if I was in person, I'd be passing these plants around just now and encouraging you all to have a little um, bite of a leaf. Um, they're quite peppery. Uh, quite like rocket is probably the, the way I would describe the taste of them. And the seeds, the dried up um, seeds, at the, once the flower has finished flowering in September time, they can be stored um, and some people use them in cooking as capers. But again, as Jenny said in the PowerPoint presentation, if you get any allergies, 
any dodgy things going on, always do a wee bit of research to make sure you're not going to have some bad reaction to it. Okay, so nasturtium seeds are relatively big, which makes them quite good for most folks to have a go at sewing. And I'm just putting them in this little tub because it makes them easier to work with. This is just a, a, a plant section that I probably bought bedding plants in last year and I kept. So I'm just going to use this for putting my compost into. I've already broken up the compost. When you get your compost out the, the bag, it will be lumpy and clumpy in bits. None of us would like to live in a clumpy environment. So break it up, give it a good wiggle with your fingers. And this activity in itself, many people find very therapeutic. I've worked with some groups where some people are quite happy to sit and just do this. So that's great. Get them to do that bit and somebody else can be getting on with the next bit. So I've broken up all the clumpy bits and I'm just going to squish it in or I could use my scoop and just fill. And we're not worrying too much about levels or anything like that, just getting a good amount in. Sugling it off a little bit. If I sugar it, it knocks out any big air holes that might be further down. Developing roots, roots don't like air gaps, they sort of like stop growing, they won't grow into the air gap. I'm just going to take a second tray, the same size as the first one, and just gently tap it down. And again, that knocks out excess air holes. Okay. This size of container, I'm going to take two nasturtium seeds and I'm going to pop them into each little section. And I'm just going to press it down a finger nails depth. That's one, two. I'm sorry for you guys have to watch me doing this. If I could sing, I would sing a song, but that's not an option. The nasturtiums will germinate in outdoors. I have to put these outside. And I might actually do that because our forecast for the next few days is quite mild. So I'm running out of space um, in the house at the moment. And you might have heard me say I've got a foily tunnel, but it's actually still finishing off its construction stage. So space is at a premium in there at the moment. So they will germinate in about seven days normally. So I've just popped them down. You can still see them just sitting a little bit, a little bit proud. I've not been popping them in far enough. So just cover them over a little bit more. Some compost. And that is me quite literally ready to go. I've already written my label with the plant's name on it and today's date. Depending on the group you're working with, you might choose to write names on the label as well. Now, because this whole tray has been sewn out with the exact same seed, I'm only going to stick one label into it. And I know that this whole section is full of nasturtium seed. Last thing I want to do is give it a good drink of water. And again, as I said, this bottle top water makes aiming and controlling the direction of the water much more manageable. Another food dish, you can all guess what I had for my tea the other night. Doesn't have a drainage hole in the bottom. And I will now set this. Um, as I say, I'm actually going to put it outside uh, because the forecast for the next few days down here is quite mild. So these nasturtium seeds will be fine outside because they are hardy. But if you're experiencing cold well, weather or a cold snap, they'll germinate indoors. And up until now, I've been germinating all my nasturtium seeds indoors. And this will sit on a windowsill. Watching on my windowsill though, I'm not going to water on top of the compost anymore. I'm going to water directly into the saucer 
and the compost will soak the water up from down below and the roots, that encourages the roots to develop um, more substantially downwards. That's my nasturtiums um, growing and I have got these are little nasturtiums that I sowed just about 10 days ago. So you can see that they're just peeking through and starting to put on their little flowers for me. And these ones are about six weeks old. So there's three in here and they're already scrambling and looking for something to hold on to to start scrambling. Joan's frozen there. Hold on a second. See if we can bring her back. Oh, apologies, folks. We seem to have lost Joan. Give us a moment and see what we can do here. I have to send her a message, Jenny. All right, thank you, Jane. Hey Joan, if, can you hear us, Joan? If you can, you've stopped recording. I think she's gone. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute now, here it is. Hi. I think we're back again. Hello. Oh, no. Can't hear you, Joan. That's us. Can you hear me? That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I have no idea what happened, but I saw you guys the whole time and Jane was phoning me and it was dead exciting. But <laughs> I could see you guys, but you couldn't see me. Anyway, right. I'll keep on moving so that in case we lose, lose connection again. Okay. Next one that I want to speak about uh, are the calendula which are the Scotch marigolds. Um, the leaves can be dried and they're known as poor man's saffron. So they're used a lot in curries and um, they're very tasty and decorative on the top of curry dishes, rice dishes and paella. So that's something um, to be thinking about. They are, these are their seeds. The calendula seeds are like little shavings they are really the cutest wee things I always think um, and even just handling oops I'm dropping them into the compost I'm going to have to blend growing everywhere um, stop and actually look at the seeds and that itself is an activity just discussing what does it look like what does it remind us of and they feel funny as well but you can't experience that at the moment. So you'll, you'll get that, that pleasure when this has come out to you. Okay, so I am using a great box, drainage holes at the bottom. And as before, I'm just filling up, making sure there's no clumpy bits. Put more in there. Too much. Give it a shiggle to settle the compost. And just picking and sprinkling over. That's a wee bit too difficult. You could use a spoon and sprinkle the seeds over, like so. Now calendula or Scottish marigold, like the nasturtium, are really hardy. They can be sown directly outdoors. So don't feel you've got to be sowing them indoors and keeping them on a windowsill. You just have to wait until the worst of the cold weather has passed so that they get a chance to get established and get growing. The reason I'm doing this just now is it gives me a, an activity that I can be doing with my client group indoors while the weather is still a wee bit variable. And it gives me an extension because I'm going to have to check them every other day for watering. So it gives us a 
a reason to keep on gardening during this sort of slightly slower period of time. So my calendula scotch marigolds are just sprinkled over the surface of here. And I'm just going to take the compost. As a rule of thumb, you only cover the seeds roughly with the same height, the same depth of compost as the depth, the size of the seed itself. So in this case, it's just a tiny little amount that's needed. More water. Water and light, that's important things for seeds at this stage. And again, I've got my label already written with today's date on it. And another food dish that doesn't have any drainage holes, and I'll sit them out. Okay, calendula, I have got calendula growing. These seeds were sown, which will check the date. I uh, can't read that. The 28th of February, these ones were sown. So these ones are now four weeks old. And you can see that they're coming up quite nicely. And I'll just take the whole, when they're ready to plant out, I'll squash these like so, squash the bottom. They're not ready to get potted out. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Just a wee bit early to be like dividing and doing anything with, but I just wanted to show you this. These are the roots starting to develop and I would actually put this whole little clump of seedlings into a patch um, in my garden and let them grow and develop from there. But I'm actually going to be planting all these edible flowers into a large half barrel and that's going to be my edible flower patch. So that's what your calendula seeds will look like in about four weeks time. Okay, next one is the rush. Borage is just loved by the honeybees and the bumblebees. And this is my favourite one because it does make the most amazing, um, uh, what's the word, uh, show, show off -y ice cubes possible. I'll tell you, if nobody's ever seen it before, they're really blown away by it. So that's my party piece in the summertime. Seeds again, slightly different from the ones that we've already looked at. We're getting a little bit smaller now. So maybe not so easy for folks to work with. But again, these can actually be sown directly outside into prepared ground and you would just quite literally sprinkle them over, rake over some um, good quality soil around about them and they should germinate and grow up quite happily. But as I've said, I'm potting these indoors so that I can get a bit of a head start on the game. Now, I am using tiny little pots now, probably primarily because I've got loads of them to hand and I um, don't like having to buy new things if I don't have to. These are actually succulent. We did a succulent potting session quite a few weeks ago and these are all the little pots left over from it. And this is the tray that the succulents arrived in. So, I'm going to be using these. Again, you can scoop it in like that. This is quite easy to just scoop and go. But it might actually be quite a nice idea to set this up as a production line. Somebody could be breaking up the compost. Somebody could be looking for the missing spoon. There it goes. And I reckon two scoopfuls of for this little part. Two scoops, yep, there we go, perfect. And fill up one, two, two scoops. One, two, could be good for children doing this. And as before, it's always good to knock out any excess air holes. So we're just taking another pot and just Damping down the compost that's in there. Two scoops. There we go. 
stop doing that. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two feeds into each of these little pots. I think that's enough space. Lift them out again so you can see them. I'm just going to drop them in the top. One, two, one, two, one, two. Now I'm hopeful we'll seed will germinate. But if I get 50% germination, I'll still be very happy because I will have certainly plenty of borage flowers to be working with later on. And as before, I'm just going to cover the seeds very lightly because again, the seeds aren't big, so they don't need a huge covering. I'm just going to tamp them down again, just to make sure that the compost has got good contact with the seed. Another Blue Peter Styley prepared label, name, today's date. Again, the whole tray is going to have the same plant in it, so I only need to put one label in just now. A good drink of water. Again, borage is another one that can be sowed directly outside. But I'll keep them indoors till they get germinated and then I'll get them potted on outside. Now, I do have borage that I sowed when were these ones sowed? Missing a label. Yeah, at the same time, 28th of, oh, 28th of January. These ones are now two months old, so they are. But you've got to remember that they're not growing in ideal conditions indoors. Um, in my living room where they were growing, it was too hot for them, so they were sort of getting checked when I was kept on moving them. But somewhere about 15 to 18 degrees, they'll germinate beautifully. Bright windowsill, keep them well watered, and you will get these. The ones that I've sown today will be this size in about four to six weeks time, just having sown them later on in the, in the season. You can see the lovely leaves coming. And again, this pot, I potted them on those little pot sizes. I potted them into here, but I will then just take this whole clump of a uh, root and plant and plonk it into my half barrel later on. Maybe, gosh, be the end of May before I actually do that, just because I'm a bit of a their cast of glute till the May is out and all the rest of it. So that's when I'll be doing that. Okay, so that was borage. And the last one I want to show you is the courgette. Now the seed that we're, we're sharing with everybody is this particular variety called All Green Bush. It's a slightly dwarfing, not quite so spready variety of courgette. If anybody's grown courgettes before, you know that the courgettes all grow nicely and neatly in one area and the leaves sprawl all over the place like no business. So I'm led to believe, I've not actually grown this one myself, but I'm led to believe this one isn't quite so sprawly. So I'm looking forward to that. And also these ones make nice, really nice wee um, dinky size ones, which were recommended to pull as small ones to encourage the plant to keep on fruiting, making more courgettes for us throughout the season. And we get to have those little tasty courgettes to make into, and well, that's um, once we've enjoyed the flowers. Uh, but the courgettes, if we let them grow into the courgettes, we will be able to make lovely courgette cake with as well. So that is the courgette. This is one that I sowed. This one's now three weeks old, so it is. Now, the courgettes have to be growing indoors at this time of year. I'll explain that a bit more in a second. So, what do we need? I'm giving these seeds their own little pot to live in. As I've said, they're a wee bit more fickle. The first few plants we've spoken about are all really easy to work with and they'll probably look after themselves without me having to do terribly much for them. 
but the courgettes are a wee bit fickle to get started. Their seeds are a bit like almonds. You can see them there. Yep. Really nice. And just really inviting. I want to do something exciting with them, like use them in art and craft something like that, but I'm not going to plant them up. So I'm just going to fill my pot. Yep, give it a wee settle down. Now you might see in here, going around, there's a sort of like a little line about a centimetre and a half down. That's known as the water line. Only fill your compost up to that height if you can. I'm going to take my seed and I'm going to plant it in edgeways into the compost. I'm just going to press it down. Cover it with some more soil. Give it a sugar to settle it. And you'll see that I've still left this area round about down to the water line, which means that when I water, that is how much water I will put in this plant, in this pot. That I know is the right amount of water for that compost that's in there. Some clever scientist has worked out how much um, volume is required. So you can see it's already soaked all the way down and I can feel it dripping out the bottom. So I know that this pot has been well watered. So, label courgette, today's date. I know what that is in there, what should be growing. And now for my plastic bag, an elastic band that I had earlier. Courgettes do like it cozy to, for their germination. They need it about 20 degrees a wee bit warmer if you can afford that for them. And they also like a kind of greenhouse effect. So this is a supermarket um, freezer bag that I've just cut the handles off to shorten the length of it. And I'm just going to pop it over, make sure you've watered the compost first of all, pop it over it, wrap the elastic band, sorry, pop it up to make sure it's all straight, attach the elastic band round about it to keep it tight, and then I'm going to sit it in this little dish, another food dish of some description, and I don't think I'll need to water this because the condensation in there will, will keep it all going quite nicely, but if I do see that it's starting to get really dry, the, the compost is going out a much paler brown corner, I'll water down into this saucer here and the compost will soak the water up. Okay, so I'll just do another one very quickly just to show you. Oops, there's a lumpy bit, we don't want lumpy bits. Should go down to the water line, sideways in, pop it down, a bit more. Cover it over. Water to the top. Label. Another poly bag and an elastic bag. Oh, she says. Hopefully. Now, as soon as you see the seed line, the seed sprouting and the little green shoots coming through the top, a bit like my nasturtium that I showed you earlier whenever I sat it. Once you see it at this stage, like this little one here at the side, take the plastic bag off of it because the sort of greenhouse environment will actually work against the development of the seedling. So it's important that you take the plastic bag off then. and it will grow up and develop. The first two seeds that grow are um, the, the baby seeds, uh, the baby leaves. And it's the second set of leaves that it produces that are known as the first set of true leaves. 
And this is the first set of true leaves just developing now. So this plant is far too young to be going outside. I'll be looking after it in my um, living room for the next few weeks. I'll definitely not be planting them out until any risk of frost has passed. And that, Jenny, is all the demonstration that I'm going to be doing on the, the flower seeds. So well, back to you. Thank you very much, Joan. There was lots going on there. Fantastic. So um, we'll wait till we get back over to your desk and uh, Jean is going to look at the questions for us and then be able to voice them to you. I'll just remove the spotlight and uh, just find you here so I can spotlight you. Whoop. And you disappeared, when you disappeared earlier, you disappeared completely from my... <laughs> and now when you want to disappear... Oh, no, I can't find you at all. Here we go. You're there, but you're just coming over. <laughs> so, just when you get a chance to gather yourself, Joan. Um, can I forget the... Uh, there we go. I want to leave. That's it. Get yourself out of there so you don't get feedback. That's great. So... I think there's been a few questions. There's time to put some more questions into the chat, folks, if you can. And I see that some people are doing that. And that's lovely. So perhaps Jane would like to kick off with the first question for Joan. OK. Um, it was David, David mentioned about the, um, the bottle top. We've had that question before, actually. They seem to be very popular. And Jenny's put a link up. So that was Seed Spring Seeds is where we got them from. But if you just look online, you should be able to get them. So that question was answered for you, Joan. So that was good. Um, and we have another question. Can you eat all marigolds? Um, do you mean the whole marigold plant or all varieties of marigold? I think it was all varieties of marigolds. Okay, um, the, I, I had a wee look into that actually and nobody ever mentions African marigold as being edible and it's always like the Scottish marigold and the French marigold. The, the African marigold is a big fat kind of pom-pom one. So my answer is I don't actually know. Eat the Scottish marigold, um, support Scotland <laughs> and eat the Scottish marigold. How about that? Okay, and when is it best to plant out the seedlings? Okay, the nasturtiums, the Scottish marigold and the borage, some of these plants actually sell seed. If you were growing them last year and you just let them die down and do their own thing, nature looks after them throughout the winter time. But depending on our winter, if it's too cold and too wet, the, the seeds that have been dropped from last year's flowers will just rot and die away. If they do survive the winter, then they will germinate themselves in the ground and start to grow. So in theory, you should be able to put your seeds outside and just cover them over with soil and let them get on with it. But because seeds are quite expensive to buy and you don't really want to lose them, I would hang fire and not sow them outdoors until at least the end of April in Scotland anyway, because that's when the worst of like the really cold weather is over and done with. And we're going to get hopefully not torrential downpours of rain. So anytime from April onwards, outdoors. Okay. And why did you plant the corgi edgeways? Edgeways? Yes. It's to do with how it germinates, where it's like there's, it's got a little hole in it. In the, in the um, shape of its, the wee kind of crispy bit that forms the seed coating, there's a tiny little hole that the water goes into. Okay. And it, it goes up in there. Now, I don't know which side it is, but providing it goes down, the water goes in the wee hole and it works itself out and the shoot comes up the way and the root goes down the way. Biology is okay. not my strong point. <laughs> And did you say it was 20 degrees, Joan, for the temperature for the courgettes? Yeah. yeah you, you obviously cut out in some people's uh, thing. I thought it was 20, 20 degrees, you actually said there. Yeah. And was it only one courgette seed per pot? And why is that? I would say one per pot because they're so fragile and I'm going to use the word pathetic. That's a shame to call them pathetic. <laughs> um, but they... The more you handle them, 
the more chance that you'll damage them. So if you've got two seedlings growing in the one pot and you go to separate them to plant them individually because you need loads of space to grow as mature plants, the chances are you'll damage the stem on one of them anyway, so you're going to waste it. So if you plant them into one, one seedling into one pot, you're reducing the risk of damaging the plant later yeah. on. Okay. And uh, can you freeze edible flowers if it's not possible to eat them straight away? Well, freeze them in ice cubes. And if you don't use them as ice cubes in your drinks, then thaw them, let the ice cube thaw out. But it's a bit like frozen fruits, you know, like thawing out frozen strawberries and frozen raspberries are a bit messy and all the rest of it. So you would have to thaw them out quite slowly and and then put them onto like, um, what do you call it? The paper kitchen roll and kind of dry them out that way. But I like Jenny's suggestion in the PowerPoint presentation of dusting them in sugar and keeping them that way. They'll keep for, well, I've never done it, but I'm going to try it. I would think they would keep for months. Right, okay. Sugar. And Mary said uh, she's not always been successful with courgettes in her current garden, which is on the slope with a clay boggy soil. In my last garden, they were great, but the soil isn't. What advice can you give about that? Grow them in a container. Clay, boggy soil, no. Nah. Even though you're on a slope and like there's maybe good drainage running away from it, you've still got the stuff in the top of the slope coming down to the roots. They don't like, I can't grow courgettes in my soil. I've got clay, boggy soil as well. And I grew, I grew mine last year in uh, tomato bags. So I did. And they were absolutely fabulous. They did really, really well. And that's all the questions we have for you today. Don't thank you very much. You're very welcome.